Good morning, everyone. And thank you for being here this morning for our Alumni Association meeting. Once again, I'm Father Matt Gerlach, priest of the Diocese of Tulsa, Oklahoma, and serving as president of the Alumni Association at this time. Last night, we introduced our new director of alumni relations, Aaron Evans, but we also want to say a great thank you to Shana Weatherholt, who is uh, moving on from this office to be the executive assistant to the development office. And so uh, we thank Shana. Be sure and say thank you to her as you go out. Uh, but she's still going to be around, which is wonderful. And the office has hired a young woman named Kayla Schaefer, who will now take Shana's place in this office for alumni relations. And so she's a local, I understand, from the St. Minor area. So it's great to have her with us. She'll start in a couple weeks, and sometime mid-August, I believe. It's a privilege now for me to introduce again Father Dennis Robinson, OSB, um, President Rector of St. Minor Seminary. Sales calm or fine, sure. Well, good morning. Good morning. It's obviously a Catholic group <laughs> here. It's in the back. The, the, a, after the break group, I'm keeping my eye on you because that's where I sit when I come to these things. <laughs> so I know what goes on back there. Uh, I am very happy uh, to be with you this morning to offer a few reflections on uh, the state of the school. I always feel like I'm the president, you know, it's like I'm giving the state of the school address, uh, but it's not January, it's, it's, it's now August. So, but I am very happy to uh, offer some reflections on uh, where we are uh, for next year. And this thing is a little, a little testy because I can't see the slide change. Let's see. There we go. It's all right. I, oh, and now I can see it. It's weird. Okay. <laughs> Story of my life. <laughs> Let me begin uh, by offering just a little bit of a reflection on uh, what we did yesterday, which was at the very beginning of the day to uh, bless and dedicate the new time capsule. And many of you uh, who were there heard the remarks that were made about the time capsule that the time capsule is something we've been doing for almost a, a thousand years, uh, really before the time of the Middle Ages. Uh, we've been doing it, we bury the time capsule, in 25 years we dig it up and we look at what's inside and say, ooh, uh, and then we bury the next one. And that's been done over a lot of time. And I would say, in general, that the time capsule is not something we think about a lot. <laughs> during uh, the interim between burying it and digging it. But this year, we decided that in the next 25 years, we're going to do something different. And so now the time capsule will be enshrined in the narthex of St. Thomas Aquinas Chapel. It will have an honored place there. And everybody who goes by there, whether they're a student or a faculty member or a staff member or a visitor, We'll have the opportunity to kind of reflect a little bit on the time capsule and what that means. But I would like uh, to kind of just reiterate some of the things I said yesterday as a way of framing what I would like to talk about today. And that is that the time capsule really represents St. Myron, which is an institution that is built on the past that is involved in the present, but is always aiming for the future. And I think that could be the kind of motto, I would say, of what I hope uh, that we are about doing here, uh, about honoring the past, certainly engaging in the present, but always looking toward the future. And uh, I recently, uh, we began our annual process of strategic planning. And in that process, uh, one of the questions that I have posed for our staff is, where do you envision St. Meinrich will be in 25 years, in 50 years? How will we get there? Because I'm sure that if we reflected upon it for just a moment, 
we would realize that uh, St. Margaret is not the same place that it was 50 years ago. And that 50 years ago, I mean, none of you were here 50 years ago. But none of the rest of you were here. But 50 years ago, I don't know that we would have imagined where we would be today if we would have even thought about some of the things that we are about today. And so I think it's important for us to continually keep uh, these ideals in front of us. St. Margaret is an institution built on the past. It is certainly living in the present, but it is yearning, I would say, for the future. So, St. Margaret in the past, Father Byron, are any of these people still living? Oh, yeah. <laughs> But you're the only one, aren't you? <laughs> of course, you, you may not remember what some of them looked like back then. You know, St. Margaret, as I said, is an institution that has been uh, certainly rooted in the past. That is part of our Benedictine heritage. I always say Benedictines are not theologians. Benedictines are historians. And we do a wonderful job of it. We, we do a tremendous job of, of kind of looking at the past and thinking about the past and building, hopefully, upon the past. But I would say that an institution cannot live in the past. And, and one of the things that I, I'm continually challenging groups like presbyterates or other priest groups that I speak to, or even this group, is that while it's wonderful to reminisce about how things were, uh, but Hell's Bend doesn't exist anymore. Uh, as, as we were uh, discussing yesterday, it doesn't ex it didn't even exist in, well, it did exist, but I don't think we called it that uh, back in my day. But we can't live there. We can't, even though there were great achievements and great things that happened, we cannot just live in the past. Likewise, St. Margaret is a present, not a gift, but a present. It is a living institution today. There are many things happening today, which I will hopefully be able to tell you about uh, in, in just a moment. But St. Margaret is an institution that's very active. You know, and one of the things I always kind of joke about when groups come through uh, that are reminiscing about the past, I'm like, you know, we're, we're still doing things today. And even though your St. Margaret may not be here anymore, at least in unless it's a memory, uh, there is a very vibrant St. Margaret uh, that exists today. And likewise, St. Margaret is always looking toward the future. And that, that's the same is true of the church. The same is true of, of any parish. The same is true of any business. Uh, the same is true of any family, right? And so unless we are imagining a future, we may not live that future, but unless we are imagining a future, unless we're planning for the future, unless we are giving our all to that future plan, then I think that the institution may be uh, a bit in trouble. St. John Henry Newman, of course, said everything. And so he said this, that growth is the only evidence of life. And I think that really captures this kind of understanding of what I'm talking about future and the need for us to continually look toward the future. Because if we stop growing, if we so rest on our laurels, so to speak, which we can, I'd say Minor does a lot of laurels upon which to plant our backsides, uh, but nevertheless, if that's what we're going to do, then we might as well begin to close down shop. Growth is the only evidence of life, and growth is not only uh, an important goal, growth is a necessity for uh, the continued uh, thriving of a parish, uh, for, uh, of any institution. Uh, Saint Dominic put it in, in a little bit of a different way. He said, stored grain rots. And I, I, I could not agree with this assessment more. Stored grain rots. And I, I think this perfectly, in my estimation, captures what I would see as an important thing. We must not store the grain, we must plant. 
and we must consume rather than just, and of course this is a very biblical ideal as well. So let me uh, do now a, a bit of uh, an observation about where St. Myron is today. Uh, and I think that we have lots of good news. As I, I said in our alumni meeting the other day, I said, uh, you know, every time I gave this report, and I've been giving this report now for uh, 17 years, uh, every time I give this, every time I gave this report, either in this group or in the monastery, I always had uh, Arch Abbot Bonaventure would say, "Don't you ever have any bad news?" <laughs> and what I wanted to say was, "You're here." <laughs> Bonaventure was one of my greatest fans, and I was one of his greatest fans. But uh, so, but. If I have bad news, I don't know it, and so maybe uh, my able administrative assistant can offer the bad news. She would say, yeah, the bad news is you're here. Uh, but uh, <laughs> where is St. Myron today? What are we doing today? Let's start by looking briefly at the seminary and what we are expecting in just a couple of weeks uh, when our next formation uh, session begins. This year, our seminary enrollment, again, is, uh, is very good. We have achieved our goal of 120 uh, seminarians. They will be arriving in, in a few weeks. This in a time that I believe it's important to note that many seminaries are really struggling with the question of enrollment. And I, at some level, I'm kind of surprised that we're not, uh, but we aren't. And our enrollment looks very, very healthy uh, for the uh, coming year. Uh, we also have a good bit of diversity uh, in our seminary uh, community, about 20 or so countries, 11 uh, different religious communities, 25 or so dioceses, uh, all, you know, very steady. We wait, will be uh, uh, welcoming one new diocese this year, uh, that is, or one returning diocese after a long time. Uh, and that is the Diocese of Bellevue, Bell, uh, Belleville. If I knew their name, they might send more stuff there. <laughs> well, that just went completely out of my head. I, I've done their priest retreat a number of times, and, but uh, I, I always, Bellevue is the mental hospital. <laughs> uh, but again, a lot of good diversity, welcoming, and a lot of strengthening dioceses, in other words, dioceses that are seeing higher enrollments with us uh, than in the past. I had a wonderful opportunity to offer a retreat for the priest of uh, the Diocese of Fort Wayne, South Bend this summer, and they will have six seminarians uh, with us in the fall, uh, and all very good men. So a lot of dioceses are really increasing their enrollment and their numbers. We are now, this year, having the full implementation of the new program of priestly formation PPF, uh, the sixth edition. That document was given us last year kind of in, by the Bishop's Conference. Wonderful, I think an excellent document. I was very uh, fortunate that we were able to put into place a good bit of those uh, recommendations or you know, now challenges uh, for seminaries uh, in, in, already in our program, including the propedeutic program, which I've heard me speak about before. The Provodeutic program or the kind of pre-pre-theology seminary program is a year of spiritual formation for young men who are preparing to enter seminary for the first time. And so it's a year of, of spiritual and human formation uh, for those uh, young men. We began our first program two years ago with uh, an enrollment of 10. We Continued last year with an enrollment of 10, and this year we have an enrollment of 20. So that's a very good sign uh, for the future. Obviously, they will, most of them will be continuing in formation. Uh, the last part of the uh, program of priestly formation is the vocational synthesis stage, and that program uh, will be put into place this spring. Uh, we've already begun the somewhat implementation of that this 
summer, but that will finally be put in place in the spring, which will bring to completion our implementation of the new program of precinct formation accomplished in just a two-year period. But that was a lot of work because we had to realign the curriculum because that last semester does not take place at St. Michael. It takes place in the diocese. And so that has been a challenge, but a good one. But the last piece of implementation, I was at a, a conference uh, last year in October for rectors uh, of U.S. seminaries. And believe me, that's a lot of fun. <laughs> Everybody's looking around the room like, what are you doing wrong? What are you doing wrong? Uh, what we found out was we're way, way ahead of the game in terms of most other seminaries. And, and some of them really don't have an idea about how they're going to implement uh, these new changes. Our faculty continues to be strong, uh, been a long-term faculty, an excellent library. Uh, we will be looking for a new librarian this year, uh, and so that's always a challenge, especially when for us, I think the challenge in new hires is the fact that our people hang around for a long time. And so Dr. Dan Cole will be departing from his library position, which he has held since the days of Gutenberg. Uh, and uh, <laughs> first printed book uh, was actually put into place. He and Father Simeon put those into place. Uh, but the library uh, will, has undergone, as you know, a renovation. And if you haven't had a chance to stop down in there to look, please do. Likewise, our Liturgical Music Institute uh, is running a program right now, believe it or not. They're all down in the library in their new space uh, learning about liturgical music. Are there challenges? There are always challenges. And this is in tribute to our Chapter Bonaventure in his memory. We are always having some staffing concerns. And one of our staffing concerns, I believe, right now is uh, Benedictine staff. Uh, we do not have as much, uh, as many resources to pull upon as we may have had in the past. And, of course, because so many of our positions uh, require uh, ordination as a prerequisite, it's sometimes difficult to find those who are involved uh, and able else to do that. So those are some of the challenges. The School of Theology, likewise, is thriving. It has had its highest uh, per capita enrollment uh, for the past 10 years. This year, it continues to make tremendous strides uh, toward uh, its, its goals. Also, the graduate theology program, the degree-granting program, has grown tremendously, mainly because of online offerings, that we have more online classes, more people who are able to participate from wherever they may be, as opposed to coming to campus. Likewise, the Institute for Priests and Presbyterians has, has done a very uh, good job. Uh, Julian has, uh, has headed that. Uh, Sister Gina and, uh, and Chase have headed the graduate program. And so just a lot of creative energy there and a lot of, of, of vision in terms of what can be uh, the next piece. So uh, the Institute, for example, has had excellent enrollments. The summer sabbatical program is going on right now. Uh, they have readjusted their budget such that they're now um, profit making for the first time in 20 years, I guess. Uh, there is, uh, has been some program reevaluations which have been, I believe, very successful for them. Uh, continuing education. Now, this is uh, an area that I'm highlighting because we have uh, done a lot of changes in this area over the past year. The office is suppressed, uh, not depressed, they are very happy, but they are suppressed. Uh, and the programs have not been eliminated, they've just been taken over by other areas of the institution, whether that is uh, the graduate theology program or whether that is uh, one of our youth programs. Uh, and the personnel have not, uh, we have not lost them, but rather the two people that work in that office have gone on to new positions uh, within the institution. And so the office per se has been uh, suppressed in that we have now decided to distribute the continuing education options away from a centralized office and toward, uh, toward uh, the uh, areas in which they, the 
program might, might be readily understood. We had last week uh, the program for spiritual directors, the formation of spiritual directors, and that was very successful. We have a lot of participation there and have had for about the past 10 years. Permanent Deacon program, very high enrollment. Uh, they have, in fact, uh, had a 50% increase in their enrollment this year in terms of the number of dioceses. Uh, there are now 16 dioceses that are using our permanent deacon formation program. Very successful, very successful program over the past 25 plus years that that has been involved. The uh, permanent deacon program has been looking at lots of things, including their summer programs, which has hosted one uh, last week of homiletics for uh, those who are preparing to be permanent deacons. Uh, we are looking at different delivery methods and, of course, uh, as always, looking for some cultural expansion of that program with uh, Spanish language opportunities. Guest services, uh, likewise, you are now uh, the uh, guest of guest services, uh, has also been growing and changing quite a bit uh, over the past year, kind of realigning itself. We have a new retreat program uh, that is already very successful. Uh, we are returning to pilgrimages. Uh, as many of you may have known uh, in the past, our brother Morris uh, was the pilgrimage uh, guru par excellence. Uh, he went everywhere. Uh, he had seen the entire world 15 times. Uh, he is now retired. And so we, uh, that program was kind of laying low for a couple of years. And now, uh, we have uh, some new uh, initiatives there. So next year, for example, uh, we will be offering a pilgrimage to Greece uh, in May. We will be offering an England pilgrimage in the summer. And we'll be offering a pilgrimage to Ireland uh, in October. So that's back up and running, and we'll have a lot more in that area with our, uh, with our new initiative with, uh, with pilgrimages. Uh, I, I was, A rather humorous story, which I don't know if I should tell. Okay. Don't tell it. Remember Stadler and Waldo uh, from the Muppet Show? All Stadler and Waldo. I was told uh, by a, a pilgrimage uh, group of people who have been on one of our pilgrimages. Brother Morris, that the first stop after the airport was always the liquor store. <laughs> he would load up on cheap wine, and uh, that from then on, everybody was pretty much drunk. So they didn't know whether they were in, in Greece or Ireland or Italy, uh, and it really didn't matter at that point, but everybody always had a great time. And so uh, it was interesting because when we announced this uh, trip to Greece, one of the future participants said, uh, is Brother Morris going? I said, oh no. And they said, well, will there be wine? <laughs> I said, can you buy it? <laughs> so, but really good enrollments for all of our programs this year. Uh, I was participating just a couple of weeks ago with a, an experimental pilgrimage to Turkey. And I'd never been to Turkey, but we have a new tour company that's kind of auditioning for us. And so they offered to take a group of us free uh, to Turkey. And I thought, oh my goodness, well, I love Turkey. I wonder if they'll be dressing. I didn't know. <laughs> but we went to Turkey, and I will tell you, it was an eye-opening experience. It was just a tremendous trip. Uh, it was, uh, everything was beautiful, and it was nothing like what I expected. So good uh, first omen for this new travel group, and so I'm very excited about that. Our youth and young adult programs, likewise, are doing well. The Redwood Cup just finished uh, its summer uh, work, excellent work this year. Three, we're back to three programs after the COVID bounce. Uh, and so it has uh, also been a great financial success for us. Hispanic ministry programs, again, very excited about many of the things that are happening there. Uh, new programs that have been developed. Uh, just last weekend, we hosted a retreat 
of four Hispanic Catholics here at St. Margaret. Many of them were young people, uh, again, very successful. We're also finding a lot of ways to interact the programs uh, of the seminary and school of theology with our, our outreach for Hispanics. So for example, next year, uh, the propedeutic students for their Sunday ministry uh, will be going to uh, Hispanic parishes in the area to uh, kind of be involved in what's happening there. This year we are beginning a new focus on children's programs. Uh, we are involved with a lot of programs that affect grade school children, so we'll keep moving it back, trying to continue to build that Catholic identity and Catholic presence among younger people. And so if you catch them in grade school, if you catch them in high school, if you catch them in those early college years, uh, there's a, a much greater chance of continuing uh, their participation in church life as opposed to trying to find ways to return them to church life uh, after being absent. So these new programs uh, under the direction of Dr. Nathaniel Marks, one of our professors of liturgy and uh, sacraments here, uh, looks very promising and we'll, we'll see where it's going. All of these programs, uh, the Hispanic program, the youth program, uh, the children's program, all of these programs are under the auspices of the decidedly avuncular work of Uncle Eli. Uh, we depend upon Uncle Eli, Lily, to uh, <laughs> continue, we love him, uh, continue to funnel things uh, towards us. I was at a meeting this summer for the ATS. The ATS meeting uh, in Atlanta, what I discovered is the Lilly Foundation has so much money, but they also have a legal requirement to get rid of it every year. In other words, they can't hold over money uh, that is designated to be distributed. So they're really struggling to find ways to give away money. I said, don't struggle. <laughs> I have direct deposit of everything that we <laughs> Finances. So one of our uh, challenges this year, one of our challenges this year was to uh, kind of look at finances. As, as you know, we have uh, an excellent endowment. We have a lot of uh, financial kind of security in that area. Really, we do uh, in, in ways that it, it's impossible to overestimate, considering our position vis-a-vis -vis other institutions like us. But we were uh, very kind of challenged by the business office, and I think in a very significant way, a very good way of looking at our bottom line and trying to do a little bit of adjustment to it. And so I was very happy with that. Because it also gave all of us, and we did a series of systematic meetings throughout the schools to engage uh, the question of our budget. And so I will just give you, I'm not going to bore you with the details, but uh, the budget did a, a little bit of a flip from last year to this year in the sense that uh, we in the schools were able to adjust our budget for a $1.5 million change to the better. So we were able to cut and increase, uh, cut expenses, increase revenues, so that we have $1.5 million better bottom line. The school uh, uh, are a little bit different in that the seminary is never going to be you know, major fund kind of raising prospect. But we, we cut the seminary's budget almost, uh, deficit almost in half. Uh, the deficit uh, was originally two million and now it's one million. Uh, and with the School of Theology, we were able to not only cut the deficit, but raise it, uh, we're into a profitable bottom line of over half a million dollars. So a $1.5 million change in our budget uh, for uh, Likewise, continuing to offer increases in salaries, etc. So, what is the future of St. Myrick? Well, I can tell you, I believe that the future.
future of St. Marguerite uh, is good. Uh, one of the important things we have to do, though, is continue as an institution to ask strategic questions. Solidifying the present while honoring the past. That's kind of my philosophy in terms of leadership. But also visioning for 25 years. Where will the church be? What will be the needs of the church be 25 years? And I go back to that image of the time capsule. I will not be here uh, when the time capsule is opened again. Uh, I, I have no doubts that that will be the case. Uh, well, I will continue to be here <laughs> for 25 years, but I will not. Uh, but St. Myron will be here in 25 years. St. Myron will continue to grow in 25 years. And right now, uh, we have a staff that is working here uh, that is so top of the line that I believe that our, our growth is, is assured. We have to ask ourselves the question, though, where will St. Michael be in 2049? Where will the Catholic Church be in 2049? But we must plan for the church of 2049. Solidifying the past, honoring the past, solidifying the present, but always looking to 2049. What do we want for our schools? And I think this is the bottom line question. Do we want our schools to survive or do we want them to thrive? And I believe that many of our companion institutions, that is to say other seminaries uh, in the United States, Many of our companion institutions right now, unfortunately, are trying to survive. They're just trying to hang on. They're trying to, I, and I talked to one uh, rector at an ATS meeting this summer, one of the nicest men, I'm telling you, he must, he must, he must inspire his students because he was a very nice, holy man. Uh, he told me that his seminary was going to uh, have an enrollment 40 this year after having had uh, in the past an enrollment of over 140. They were going to be down to 40. They had recently lost their campus. They lost the seminary. They were now living in uh, temporary buildings um, on the nearby college campus. They were making uh, a profit every year of about $40,000 after they had raised about $4 million a year. And when I asked them what they had in their endowment, because we were having a very friendly conversation, he said, oh no, we spend that endowment money every year. So they raised the money, but they, they spend it immediately. And I said, how many benefactors does that $4 million or $40, you know, $4 million represent? And he said, about six. So in other words, it's not a broad base that it's delivering that money. So I thought, thank God I'm going home. <laughs> the consequences of survival mode really is death. An institution that is in survival mode will not survive. Uh, we will see, they will see a decline in facilities uh, to the point that they are unable to kind of maintain uh, the facilities that they have. Because remember, a lot of these seminaries today were built for, uh, you know, two or three hundred students often. And you can't maintain a building for, that was built for three hundred students if you have forty students. And that becomes one of the, the great questions is the, the financial picture of the facilities will eventually just erupt in terms of the vitality of the institution. But they also come and have a lack of competitiveness. And this is, this is the consequences of, of survive. This is when you rest on your laurels. And I'm not saying that many of our struggling uh, seminaries in the country or schools of theology uh, are doing that. Many of them have no control over what is causing their decline. But one of the great problems is an attempt to show that the history of the place is all that it really has to offer uh, at a given moment. How do we get to thrive? Because that's our goal. How do we get to thrive? 
Well, first of all, I think that prayer and openness to the Spirit is essential. Not only our prayer and our openness to the Spirit, but that of every person who is connected in any way uh, to the legacy and the present of St. Margaret. That we continue to pray and that we continue to be open to the discernment of the Spirit. I believe it is necessary that we be bold in expanding the vision of our institution. That we not shy away from trying things that may or may not work, and sometimes won't, but they must be tried. That we continue to find that vision that is going to enable us to be important players for the future, and ones that are providing for the needs of the church, both today and tomorrow. Our goal is to honor the church, but it is also to honor a changing church. To honor a church that continues to develop in its own right, in its own way. And one of the last things we need is a lot of nostalgia for a church of the past that we envision but never really existed. And our task is to see that the church is not only changing, but that we are helping and assisting with that change. Our task is to set trends, not to follow them. To be able to be the leaders in theological education in every capacity for this country and not merely to wait. And I think our recent implementation of the propedeutic program was essential in that way. We wanted to be out there at the beginning offering these new visions which the new PPF has provided. We always, always need to be ahead of the curve. Not looking back, not even looking around but looking ahead down the road and finding a way to meet the challenges that the road sometimes offers. And we need to continue to solidify our financial security so that St. Margaret is able to do what it has been doing so well for over 150 years or 150 more. And so it is my goal, even though I shall not live to see it, that many time capsules will continue to be opened and set for the future here at St. Michael. So thank you all for the role that you play uh, in this wonderful uh, tradition and legacy, but also in our future. And I would be very happy to entertain any questions. That, yes, yes, you've been waiting all day because you've read yours immediately. As you know, Dennis, uh, uh, the Synod, one of the uh, things that has come up uh, in recommendations has been obviously monitoring and watching and seeing what's going to happen. But I would say that hopefully that what we would experience is that we've already anticipated some of those changes. Uh, it's very interesting that of the four priests that have been invited to the upcoming uh, synodal talks, one of them is a graduate of St. Margaret, and one of them is a new graduate of St. Margaret, so very happy to see that. But I also believe that, uh, you know, we, we need to, to wait and see what's going to happen, but we also need to be already planning for that future. And, and I, I think we are, and so I, I'm, I'm comfortable uh, with our future vision. So that's where I would say we would be. Other, other questions or comments? Yes. Yes, we still offer that uh, every year. Uh, we usually have maybe four, sometimes five participants who come from that, and they are often, they can take either seminary classes or graduate classes while they're here. So we do offer that, yes. Are you planning a sabbatical? No, not really, but <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you, a, I'll give you a, a scholarship if you want to come. Two dollars off. That's <laughs> Other questions that I can answer, other anything that people would have. Come on. We have to have some questions. Thank you all. Oh, okay, yeah, no, no question. Don't start clapping. Uh, <laughs> I think, what, and 
I would say I think this is a challenge of the institution. It is one that we discuss a lot. But I want to see a greater integration between the seminary, the graduate theology program, and the permanent deacon program. And the reason for that is, first of all, it's in our mission statement that the three programs work together. Isn't that right, Rob? No, it's not. Uh, but second, it is, I think it's necessary that priests, for example, be formed in context that is already preparing them to work very uh, carefully with graduate, with, with lay ministers, with permanent deacons, in a way that the current alignment of the programs doesn't necessarily allow. In other words, because seminarians go to school for this amount of time, graduates go to school in this time, deacons do something completely different, they're never really all together. But I think we have to find ways of bringing them together. And should I say it? I better not say what's on my mind. <laughs> I think it's necessary for us to revisit the residential graduate student program, uh, which we have not. We've had on and off graduate students who have lived on campus, but we've not had that residential program in more than 25 years. So anyway, that, that gives you a little bit of what I would hope. Other questions or anything else? Well, good. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Father Dennis. One of the highlights of this evening gathering at the meal is to uh, bestow a distinguished alumnus award on one of our distinguished alums. Uh, and now the, the um, nominating uh, time is open, so begin to think about who you might nominate. Um, there are some criteria, and I believe that's online, is that right, Aaron? Criteria for uh, nomination, uh, for the purpose of it as well. So the nomination submissions will close on August 31st, so you've got about a month, everyone. About a month to think about and to submit names so that the board has time in our fall meeting to have already spoken with the uh, administration and the abbot, make sure, and then make sure that the person that receives that award is able to make plans to be here next summer. So that way, it's just a, a courtesy to them so that they can make plans to be here to receive the award. So the sooner we can do that, the better. And so uh, nominations are open now through the end of the month of August, August 31st. There is an alumni survey uh, available paper copy available where you checked in at registration. It's also online, and so we would invite you to do that. It's, that doesn't have anything to do with the, this uh, reunion necessarily. There is an evaluation form, however, for the reunion we'd like you to have, uh, fill out as well. Those are available at the registration desks. But this is a survey for this year, 2024. We want to serve you. We want to serve the alumni of this uh, institution, so we want your help and feedback on how we can do that. If I could have the board members that are present stand up, just so uh, you can put some faces to who are to serve, uh, who serve the committee. I'm very blessed with that, uh, that group of people. And finally, any questions for us as, uh, as board members or uh, anything we can answer for you from our perspective? Uh, a talk starting at 10, so we don't have a lot of time. But um, thank you for your presence this morning. Uh, we are blessed to uh, be in the positions we're in to help continue to flourish the relations we have with our alumni, from uh, new alumni to the oldest alumnus and, uh, and everyone in between. So we thank you for your presence this morning. Have a wonderful day.